Okay, good morning everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about the graphical syntaxes for domain-specific languages. And I will start by saying a few words about the importance of graphical modeling in software engineering and in model-driven engineering. We're going to talk a little bit about how to design uh, effective graphical syntaxes. That's a, the theoretical part of this lecture. So what are good principles to follow um, in order to define a, a, a good uh, graphical syntax. And then we'll get to the tooling part. So we'll talk about a framework that sits on top of EMF that we talked about yesterday. This new framework is called GMF. It, starts, it stands for Eclipse Graphical Modeling Framework. And we're going to see uh, what it involves, the extra, uh, the extra facilities it involves, the kind of output you, you should expect from it, uh, and also some of, the, some of its limitations. And we're going to talk very briefly also about uh, some of the competing frameworks to, uh, to GMF. Uh, we're also going to talk about a tool that builds on top of GMF. So we have EMF, we have GMF, and then on top of that we have a, yet another tool called Eugenia. And the, the purpose of that tool is to simplify the development of common case GMF editors. Um, and we're going to talk about how it does it by annotating um, equal meta models and then how we can fine tune the results and, and kind of get very close to uh, the end result that we, um, that we wish using uh, policing transformations. But first things first, let's go into the theory part uh, first. So um, I think it's clear that diagrams have a very important role to play in, uh, in software engineering, um, especially when interacting with non-technical uh, people. And software, and software is usually just one part of the picture in most systems. There are, there are business people involved, there are other types of engineers, uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers involved, and we need to somehow communicate across these boundaries. So this is where diagrams play a very important role because um, they're quite uh, uh, intuitive to understand by uh, people who are not familiar with the, the intimate details of what, we're, of what we're representing and who would be lost uh, if we were just to show them Java or any other kind of text-based programming or, or modeling language. So this example here, you don't need to understand much about, uh, about what's going on to figure out that, well, if, uh, if, if you get asked if you can move from any state to any other state to quickly answer that actually the, the, here seems to be a problem. That wouldn't be so easy to, to do for someone who is not familiar with programming languages, for example, if we just showed them that, um, that switch statement. Um, the reason why diagrams are, are so useful is because uh, they actually make use of the power of our visual system. So a visual representation, when we see a diagram, the visual system of our brain kicks in, which is highly parallel in nature. And that's why we can see a picture and we can immediately kind of get a, a feeling about what's, uh, what's happening there. Now, on the other hand, uh, textual representations are processed serially by the auditory system, the same system in our brain we use to hear. And this is a much slower uh, system. So um, we can extract a lot more information in one go from a diagram with little effort, because our brain is wired up like that. But um, it takes a lot more effort to actually go through text, because we go through it in a serial way, in a line-by-line -line way. Um, of course, both systems have their uses. Text is, is better, as we, will, as we will see, for uh, kind of uh, concentrating and when, when we actually need to, need to focus. Uh, but diagrams are quite good to get that kind of uh, high level uh, overview of, uh, of what's going on. OK, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to design graphical syntaxes. And uh, we should start with, the, with the, the big picture here. So what we're trying to do when we're, uh, when we're visualizing, when we're producing a diagram, is we're trying to take an intended message from the head of a person over to the head of another person, right? And everything in between are just tools that we use to, that we use to do that. 
So um, in this setting, the original message, the original idea lives in the head of the diagram creator who needs to encode it in the form of a diagram. And then uh, that diagram is decoded by the diagram user in order to understand and to replicate in their brain what, uh, what the diagram creator intended. So the diagram, in this case, is just the signal, um, the medium through which this communication happens. So how does decoding happen? Um, we have two, two steps. The first one is called perceptual processing. And this is where we kind of form the, the big picture of, the, of, of what we are seeing. Uh, this is highly parallel and, and very fast. And then we need to start focusing on individual subparts of the diagram. And this is where cognitive processing happens. And this is where we develop this deep understanding of, of what's going on, right? where we start to reconstruct this model with more details in our, in our head. And a good graphical syntax should try to minimize this part of the effort, which is, um, which is hard and which is uh, slow, and maximize the information we can extract in this first step. Um, and we'll talk about how to, how to do this, how to achieve this. There are certain, certain principles. Um, so there are nine core principles that have been identified for designing effective graphical syntaxes that, maximize, uh, the, that maximizes this bit and minimizes this bit. And we'll go through a few of them. So the first principle is called the semiotic clarity. And this means that there should be, uh, and under this principle, uh, we should be trying to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between symbols and the concepts that they refer to. Um, we could have a diagram where everything, everything is, a, is a box, right? So um, like the, that in, the, in the case of these uh, flowcharts diagrams we, we designed yesterday, everything could be a box. A decision could be a box. A speak action could be a box. Everything could be a box. This means that when we look at the diagram, we don't extract that much information. So everything looks the same. Everything looks like a box. And then we have to be looking at each individual node to decide what it is. Is it a decision? Is it an action? Now, what we did by... Um, representing decisions as diamonds, we just make them very quickly identifiable without having to look into, into the detail. If I show you a flowchart diagram and I ask you how many decisions there are there, you can answer very quickly. It wouldn't be that quick if we had to go through each one, each one of them. So this is what that principle says, that every concept in the language should ideally have some sort of different symbol. In this, in this regard, the, the diagram I showed you was not great because we had three different types of actions, and all of them looked like rectangles. Right? So you could not very easily discriminate between um, speak actions and input actions and uh, redirect actions. Right? A good graphical syntax would make that easy to, uh, to distinguish. Now, what happens if, uh, we, if we have a concept for which there's no symbol? We call that a symbol deficit. It means that we cannot instantiate that concept graphically in our diagram. Symbol redundancy happens when, for the same concept, we have two different representations, and that can create some confusion when you, when you look at the, at the diagram. On the flip side, we can have symbol overload. And this is what we, what we had in our language, because we had more than one concept map to a rectangle. Right? And then um, a less common issue is uh, that of symbol excess, where we have something in our diagram that doesn't correspond to, to anything in our model, to no concepts of our modeling language. So the idea is to try to aim for a one-to-one -one mapping, not, have, um, not to have redundancy, not to, not to have overload, but just to have a clear mapping between concepts and, uh, and diagram elements. Now, the second principle is to maximize the perceptual discriminability. And this means that, uh, well, we could have different, uh, different symbols for our, our, our actions and our decisions. 
um, and they could differ in shape, but shape is only one of the uh, only one of the retinal variables. So um, if they varied both in terms of shape and color, that would be even better because that they, they would be even easier to, to distinguish. And we have uh, eight parameters here. So we can, we can play with shapes, we can play with sizes, we can play with colors, textures, orientation, brightness, and then the horizontal and vertical position of, of diagram elements, right? And these all contribute to them being um, visually unique and easy to, easy to identify. Okay, so with that in mind, which of these, uh, of these two syntaxes are more effective, would you think? And why? Okay, so who says the first one? Okay, why? Mm -hmm. So the first one, because all of them are different. So this one. Yeah. I mean, there is no partition in like process and data, like the second one, which is maybe excessive thinking. So you're saying that this one has excessive. So first of all, this one has the same symbol for these two concepts, for a data store and for external entity. Um, which is not, not great. I mean, this one is not doing much better, but at least it has this separator here. So there is a visual, a visual distinction. Um, it would have been better if process here perhaps was a circle because that's, again, more distinguishable than a, just a rounded rectangle where you have to look at the corners to decide if this is an entity or a, or a process. But then again, you get, again, you get this line over here which, uh, which clears things up a little bit. So it's this sort of syntax, this sort of, of design decisions that you should be avoiding when you're making uh, concrete syntaxes, when you're making diagrammatic syntaxes for your language, languages. By default, uh, graphical modeling frameworks will just kind of make everything a gray rectangle. And this is where you need to start putting the effort to produce symbols that, that make sense and that are easy to distinguish between each other. Okay, um, the third princip principle is called semantic transparency. And this refers to the extent to which the meaning of a symbol uh, is, is intuitive and it can be inferred from its, uh, from its appearance. So uh, here, for example, uh, just by looking at this, uh, at this shape, you can tell that uh, A either precedes uh, B or it causes B, right? This is without knowing anything about what this language is. Uh, that's, that's the natural interpretation. Now, if for some reason I had designed my graphical syntax to mean that B is before A, right, and this is entirely possible, then that would be really confusing, right? That would create mental overload in order to, have, to remember that, well, when I see this arrow, it actually means the opposite thing from what I think uh, it means. The same goes with uh, uh, subclassing or subset, so compartments, uh, uh, space, spatial containment is a very uh, intuitive way to show belonging, to show uh, things like a, a subset relationship. Um, spatial overlap can show intersection and then uh, positioning, uh, positioning something above something else uh, tends to show uh, hierarchy, right? And again, it would be very confusing if B was the manager of A, right? Um, we don't have to stick to symbols only. We don't have to stick to, to like squares and circles, etc. We can also use icons. And icons carry, can carry a lot of information. Uh, so we can stick a little icon, uh, for example, here in the corner of these, of these icons, and that will make them much easier to, of uh, these uh, shapes, and we can make them much easier to, to discriminate. Okay, if we know one thing about diagrams, and maybe the reason why many of us 
kind of dislike diagrams to some extent is because they don't scale very well. If you create a UML class diagram with 50 classes, you kind of spend more than 50% of your time trying to take the lines, like playing snake, uh, uh, and minimize the, the overlap between nodes and lines and stuff like that. And th this is terrible. I mean, these diagrams are unmaintainable because if someone asks you to you know, put another box somewhere here, it's a good reason to quit your job and start like <laughs> find something else to do. Um, but this is because we don't treat diagrams right. Um, the, there's no reason why we should have so much information on one diagram in the first place. Um, a diagram should have up to nine elements, uh, roughly, roughly speaking. If we need more complex structures, we can use things such as hierarchy and modularization. We can use things like sub-diagrams. We can have a top-level diagram, and then we can double-click on a node. We can go to, it, to the next level of detail and the next level of detail, and so on and so forth. There's really no reason to try to put everything in one, uh, in one diagram. I think the reason why we intuitively try to do that is because of the, of the tools we are used to, to using. If you use um, uh, like drawing tools, they, they don't normally have this concept of a sub-diagram, so you have to do your best to fit everything in one, uh, in one picture. Modeling tools, on the other hand, they provide sub-diagrams. Modeling frameworks provide support for sub-diagrams for your own domain-specific languages. So it's a feature that you need to seriously think about using um, every time you're designing a, a domain-specific language, which will be used to construct models of more than like 10, 20 elements. Um, and we'll see how this is, uh, we can achieve this in GMF, in the, uh, in the Eclipse graphical modeling framework. Another principle that, uh, that we need to keep in mind and that we need to follow where possible is the complementarity of uh, uh, text and graphics. So we said that graphics, shapes, etc., they're easier to, to discriminate and we should, uh, we should prefer them where possible. This doesn't mean that text is useless. Actually, putting text and graphics together, it's much more effective than using one, one of them. So uh, here we can see examples that combine uh, text and, and graphics. Um, we have this uh, graphics-only approach where we show this one-to-many relationship using this chicken foot symbol over here. Uh, we have the same but uh, with just the textual encoding, so we don't differentiate in terms of the lines, but we just specify multiplicity here. And you can see how it's much more clear what's going on here, uh, because the one reinforces the other. So if you were not really sure what that chicken foot uh, symbol means, now you know, right? Now you can, you can tell that it probably means many. So yes, combining text and graphics is, uh, is a good idea. Now, the fact that we can differentiate and we can create all sorts of symbols with all sorts of colors and shapes, etc., it doesn't mean that we should turn our uh, um, uh, domain-specific syntax into a carnival, right? Uh, we need to think about graphic economy. We need to think that about the fact that a person can only keep so many combinations of colors and shapes and they're kind of mapping to concepts in their head. So we need to kind of constrain our, our, ourselves and not, not go wild. Uh, otherwise, you end up with something extremely colorful that is very hard to, to understand. OK, um, so there are, other graf there are other graphical design principles that we won't go uh, into in this, uh, in this lecture, but I strongly encourage you to read this paper called The Physics of, of Notations. Uh, which was the, the paper that introduced these, uh, these principles in the first instance, um, and, uh, uh, and, and read more about the, the remaining three uh, principles. Okay, so enough with the theory part. This is something you should keep in mind when you design your graphical syntaxes. Now we're going to talk about how you design graphical syntaxes. What tools do we use, and, and, what, uh, uh, and what is the, the output we should expect? And in particular, we're going to start with the Eclipse uh, modeling, uh, with the Eclipse graphical modeling framework. So, 
so yesterday we talked about how to create uh, meta models with EMF and how to then create models that conform to, to these meta models. And if you have any software development experience at the back of your head, you might be thinking, like, why do we need all that, right? I could capture this information in a JSON file or in a YAML file or in, a, um, in an XML file. Um, if I wanted to organize a conference or whatever, or to organize these, uh, these research projects, I could just have my XML file and I could type in all the partners and, the, and uh, the work packages and everything. Why do I need to, why do I need Eclipse? Uh, why do I need to, to know all of that stuff? And the main reason is because EMF is really the foundation of a larger ecosystem of technologies. So, for example, if you were to use uh, XML or JSON or um, YAML to, to, to capture this information about your conference or about your, uh, about your, your grant proposal, then if at some point you wanted to add a graphical modeling interface on top of it, you would be pretty much on your own, right? You would have to rediscover, essentially reinvent the wheel, find a graphical, like a JavaScript library, and then try to make it fit with your, uh, with your underlying um, XML document so that uh, whenever you change your document, uh, your diagram is updated or vice versa, then at some point, uh, you would uh, come up with a need for model validation. So not everything that you type into your XML document or your JSON document um, is, uh, uh, is valid. So you would need to write some validation rules. And again, you'd have to take a third generation programming language, just improvise again, write your validation rules in some shape or, or form. Um, by starting with EMF, when you need these capabilities, there are existing frameworks that you can start leveraging and you can get this uh, functionality at a very, very low price. Uh, and I don't mean monetary price, I mean in terms of effort. So you will see how easy uh, it is to literally with uh, five lines of code to create a fully fledged graphical editor for a flowchart uh, based language using GMF and Eugenia. And good luck trying to do that with a technology that hasn't been built for that, uh, for that purpose. Okay, so um, GMF is a framework that sits on top of EMF and it supports the development of diagram-based editors uh, for models conforming to uh, eCore meta models. So um, yesterday we saw how we can generate from an eCore meta model how we can generate a tree-based editor um, which we can use to create our models. Today we're going to see how we can generate a diagram-based editor that we can, do, we can use to do the same, right? So we'll end up with exactly the same models, just a different environment for, for constructing them. <coughs> GMF works in a generative manner. Um, so we saw that in EMF, uh, you could register your meta model and in the same workspace, you could create instances of it. That doesn't work in, in GMF, you have to generate code. You have to generate code, you have to launch a new instance of Eclipse and your graphical editor will be there uh, waiting for you. So what should you expect? out of GMF. Um, this is like Eclipse, uh, the, the, your regular views, your project explorer, your properties view. Uh, what we get out of GMF is a new dedicated editor uh, with all the concepts of our language in a palette on the right hand side and then we can drag and drop them and then when we select them we can go and change their properties here, right? So from DMF, we'll get the editor, we'll get a new, uh, a new file wizard, we will get a dedicated extension for our, for our diagrams, um, and lots of other goodies. And all that comes almost for, almost for free, as, as we will see. Okay, so um, thinking about our uh, our meta model uh, from yesterday about our, our, our file our, our flowchart meta model. Um, we don't have quite enough information in it uh, to generate a graphical editor. We don't. So in in our meta model, uh, actions and decisions and transitions are classes. We don't say anywhere that. Uh, actions and decisions should be visualized as nodes, while transitions should be visualized as edges. This information is nowhere in the, in the meta model itself, it's just in our head. 
we don't also specify that the root concept is a flowchart, right? We said that we need in EMF, we need to introduce that kind of root class for our meta model. And, we, and in the case of our meta model, it was the flowchart class that contains all the states and the, um, that contains all the actions and the transitions and everything. But we don't state that anywhere in, uh, in the meta model itself. So in order for GMF to be able to generate this nice editor, it needs additional information. So uh, what, what should each E-class be visualized at as a node, as a connection? Um, if we have uh, labels, uh, where should they be? Should they be internally to the nodes? Should they, should they be externally uh, to the nodes? Um, if we have a containment reference, should be visualized as a link, should, be vis should it be visualized as a spatial um, containment in the form of a compartment. So there's a lot of information that we don't actually have in, in the model and that we would need for GMF to generate a graphical, a graphical editor. So in order to, uh, to add this information, GMF provides three models. Um, these are regular EMF models, so you can open them with the EMF tree editor and you, can, and you can edit them. We'll see examples of how they look in practice. The first one, uh, the GMF graph model defines all the shapes involved in the editor. So this is where we can create our rectangles with like fancy borders and shadows and background colors and, and gradients and so on and so forth. This just defines shapes. Right? It doesn't link them to the concepts of our language. It's just a, a drawing tool with a terrible tree-based interface. Now, the GMF tool model, that's the second model that complements our meta model. And here's where we define the tools uh, for the editor palette. So there's where we define what tools we will see in our editor palette, like action, decision, subflow, trigger, etc., but also how they will be grouped in, in folders. Right? So this is quite a, quite a simple model. And then finally, we have a GMF map model, which really maps um, graphical elements, so shapes that we created in our GMF uh, graph model, with actual uh, classes in our meta model. So it says that this nice rectangle, it actually maps to an action. And it also maps tools in the palette uh, to uh, e-classes, so that when we drag an instance of action, a new action is created in our, uh, in our uh, editor. Uh, as I said, constructing these, uh, these models um, is, uh, is, not an, is not an easy job because uh, you have to, so GMF only provides tree-based uh, tree based editors for these. And there's a good reason for that. It's because they, these are very complex models. So when you right-click for a new child to a node, you will see that you get like a, a screen, um, a screen long list of, of options. It would be very, very hard to have a graphical syntax for, uh, for this. So you don't get a lot of support when you're actually trying to, to create these models. Um, but uh, and these are quite quite complex and interconnected. And there are all sorts of things that can go wrong. You can forget to set a property of something and then it just crashes or you get a, a compile time error when you, when you generate. Um, so once we have these three models, the graph, the tool, and the mapping model, uh, GMF has a model to model transformation that takes all of these and the meta model and produces a generator model. And this, is, uh, this has a GMF gen suffix, and this contains all the information that GMF needs in order to generate lots of Java code that implements uh, the, the editor. Then the final step is for a model to text transformation to consume that GMF gen and actually produce, produce the, the code. And this comes in the form of a new Eclipse plugin. So you will see that we had um, uh, yesterday, when we generated code from our meta model, we had a, uh, we ended up with four Eclipse plugins. Uh, we had a, a, our floatsort plugin, a floatsort.edit, a floatsort.edit, or some tests. Now we'll also get a floatsort.diagram, separate project that holds the uh, the GMF editor. 
So as I, as I hinted, the GMF, these GMF-specific models are quite hard to, to get right. Um, the the meta-models of the, of the GMF graph and the GMF map uh, models are quite, quite big. And uh, if you get things wrong, when, when things work, they work fine. But when they don't, when you forget something or get, when you get something wrong, um, you get either incomprehensible errors when you try to generate your code, the generator breaks at some point, or you just get compilation errors in, uh, in, your, in your Java. And it's quite hard to work them back uh, to what, what, what you did wrong with your, uh, with your models. Plus, if you modify your eCore meta model because these are separate models, then uh, you will need to remember what, how, they, how the, these other models map to your meta model and go and update these uh, manually. So not all hope is lost um, because there is a tool that sits on top of GMF and it makes life easier for, uh, I don't know, 90% of the editors you will, you will want to build. So that tool is called Eugenia and uh, it works by, uh, instead, of using, instead of using these extra models uh, to, to attach information about what is a node and what is an edge and what is the border, of uh, what is the border color of that node, etc. It uses annotations which are embedded in the meta model. So now instead of having information scattered across four artifacts and five artifacts, if you think of the GMF generator model, uh, all the information about your editor is in one uh, is in one file in the meta model itself. So Eugenia kind of centralizes this information in the meta model. And it also provides a set of uh, validation constraints that catch co common errors. So you get sensible error messages as opposed to compilation errors um, in, the, in the Java code. Of course, Eugenia sits on top of GMF. It doesn't replicate it. Um, and therefore, from these annotations, it automatically produce, produces these GMF graph, GMF map, and GMF tool models. And then it hands over to GMF to do what it knows best and to, and to produce the, uh, the final code. Okay, so this is our meta model and I've added uh, Eugenia annotations. So uh, just ignore them for now. What we had was a class flowchart which had the number of nodes and the number of transitions. And then we had our nodes with a label and incoming and outgoing transitions. And then we had actions and decisions, which extend the uh, node. And then in our meta model, the one we created yesterday, we also had subtypes of, of actions. We had three different subtypes of, of action. <coughs> okay, so what we are adding with Eugenia is just these blue lines, right? So first of all, we annotate the flowchart class uh, using this gmf.diagram annotation, and that marks that class as the container of everything in our model. Then we specify that nodes, uh, that instances of the node class, will actually be visualized as nodes in our graphical editor. And they will have a label which will reflect the value of their label property here. And then we also specify that transitions will be visualized as links, as connections in our, in our graphical editor. They will have a label that reflects the value of their label property. They will have, and then their source will be the value of their source property, and their target will be the value of their, uh, of their target property. And this is pretty much all the information we need to provide in order to get a fully functional graphical editor out of our language. So these are only two or three of the annotations provided by, by Eugenia. Um, there is an extensive tutorial under the Epsilon website. And this is where you will find all the different annotations supported for classes, for references, for attributes, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty much everything. That's all the information we need to provide to our meta model then we can generate an editor. And th here is, I think, where I switch to a live demo. Uh, 
Okay, so let's go back to our meta model from yesterday. Um, so in our meta model, we call the container model, not, not flowchart, right? I will add an add GMF dot diagram annotation to it, and that means that this is now our canvas, that the model is, is a canvas. Um, so a link we will visualize as a GMF dot link. And um, well, this is confusing. So what I'll do is I'll change this from source and target into from and to. And I will also add a text attribute. So we'll have to change this as well to from and to for consistency. OK, so our, a link, uh, instances of the link class, which just happens to be called the link. Um, Oh, I think we actually changed this yesterday to show how to show you how the uh, the EMF editor responds when we actually break things. So I'll just change this to transition again. Yeah, these are not good names. Okay. So transitions are visualized as links, and they have a label which is the text. Right, so this is the value of the text uh, property of the transition, and the source of the link is the from um, reference of the transition, and the target is the to reference. Okay, and then uh, steps. So all the steps, actions, decisions, speak actions, and so on and so forth, I will just mark as nodes for now. So all steps are nodes that have a label that reflects the value of their text property. And annotations in Eugenia are inherited. So because action extends step, it will also be marked as a node unless we override this, unless we specify uh, something else. OK, I think that's pretty much it. So with these three lines of, uh, uh, of extra information, I can now right click and go Eugenia, generate GMF editor. And you will see these three models that I mentioned before, the GMF graph, the GMF map, and the GMF tool models. While GMF is doing its thing, I will just open them so that you can see what goes in here. So here we have one figure for every concept in our meta model, a decision, a speak action, a redirect action. If you look at the figures, uh, all of them are rounded rectangles at the moment. They have a certain margin with certain insets. And these are models generated from Eugenia by these annotations that we specify. This is the default that Eugenia produces. Now, what else could we add here? Lots and lots of things. Right? So GMF offers a very rich meta model for designing shapes and very complex and composite shapes. And you can have labels in certain parts of these shapes, and they can be exposed as top level references, etc. You can do very, very complicated things with, uh, with GMF. Um, and then we get the map model that says that, well, Let's go to properties. That says that a speak action is actually mapped to uh, the speak action node, which we specified in our in our uh, graph model, right? So this is what what does the the mapping, and it also is also mapped to this creation tool, which lives in our GMF tool model. So here you can see the two folders, the two groups of tools that appear in our palette, objects and connections, and then the different tools that are in, uh, uh, in, these, in these two folders, right? 
Okay, I distracted your attention and while you've been looking at these models, uh, this diagram project has been generated which holds the code to our editor, to our graphical editor. So now I can right click and say run this again as an Eclipse application. Okay, and what I'll do is I will create a new other. See, before we had this new flowchart model uh, entry in our new file at, uh, dialog, now we also have this flowchart diagram option. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave this, the name as is. You see that the extension is flowchart underscore diagram. It's whatever the extension of our um, abstract syntax is underscore diagram by default, but then again you can change that. And we'll just finish. See, I didn't, in this case, I didn't need to, to choose what is the root object of my model because I've actually specified this in the, in the meta model. We set it in, at, at a class as GMF diagram. Okay, so now I can start creating models. And I create uh, decisions. And I can create transitions between them. Right? And I can replicate the um, enter your account number. Okay, now if I select an element here and I go to the properties view, you can see how I can populate its properties as I, as I could do in the, um, in the tree editor. Now, if you look closely, when I created my diagram, it, another file was created. So I have this default flowchart diagram, which is what I created, but also this default.flowchart, which is a file that was created in the background. And this is because by default, GMF keeps the abstract model from the layout information separately in separate files. So I can open my dot flowchart model, and this is where all the semantic information is kept: my sp my speak, my actions, my decisions, my transitions, etc. If we open the flowchart diagram with a text editor. Unsurprisingly, it's XMI again. And then if we look a bit more closely, what happens here is here we have um, our uh, speak action node. So this one is the persisted representation of this one here. If you look at it, what's, what's going on? Well, it says that it's a shape. It has a certain font name, and so on and so forth. It is, um, it is of type dec uh, decoration node, which we don't care about. But then it has this element here. And it says that this is actually a link to an element in the default flowchart model. So the diagram doesn't replicate the information in the model. It just links to it, right? Which means that if I was to go and change this model and table bank one and open my diagram again, we would see the updated value here because that information is not stored in the diagram, it's only stored in the model. The diagram only stores where this rectangle is and if we have like bend points in, uh, in connections, etc. It doesn't hold any semantic information, which means that we can, for when we are actually writing our code generators or our model validation, we can ignore the diagram. The diagram doesn't have any useful information for us. All the semantic information lives in the, uh, in the model here. 
OK. Um, so what, what else could I demonstrate? Yes, let's do a little bit of customization. So uh, every time I change my meta model, I will need to regenerate my GMF code, which means that I will need to restart my Eclipse. So I'm exiting this new Eclipse, and I'm going to modify the meta model. Now, I said that it's a good idea um, to, to try to break down your models, your diagrams, into sub-diagrams so that you don't end up with these huge spaghetti diagrams. How do we do this? We, first of all, our uh, abstract syntax needs to accommodate this, so we need to have some notion of like sub sub models, sub flowcharts, sub packages, sub systems, whatever. So what I'll do is I will add a, a containment reference called sub models, which is of type model. And here I will say that the model is both a diagram. and a node. And what else do I need to say? And also, a model extends step, so that we can create another step, which is really just a, ref a link to, an, to a sub-model. OK. Um, Let's rerun the, our generator. <coughs> OK, and run a new instance of Eclipse. So if we open our diagram again, so I could add another model here that says manage existing customers. And I could uh, delete this one, right? And I could have another model that says manage new customers. And we can have a transition here. Set transition says yes. Another transition that says no. And then if we double click this one, it will open a new diagram where we can create more actions and more transitions, right? And we don't have to try to fit everything in the same diagram. So here we could have an, uh, um, uh, an input action that says, please enter your account number. And I can close this diagram. And when I double click this again, it's still here uh, waiting for me. OK, so. Um, the complexity of the model is not a good reason to have a complex diagram, right? You can have many diagrams. And here, I could have yet another model that says, like, manage premium customers if I wanted to add more We could start with a, um, a decision, for example, and say, are you a premium customer? No. Yes. And then I could have a separate sub-diagram for, uh, for my premium customers. OK? And it can go all the way down to, to, to handle all the, 
uh, all the detail I may want to, to have in my model. Um, now, another thing is that uh, not all the information in a modeling language needs to live in the diagram, right? Um, you may have, uh, for example, uh, here in your meta model, if you were to, to generate code, uh, where's the meta model? Here, um, if you if you eventually want to generate code from these uh, from these models of yours, you may have a lot of information. So you may have some configuration elements that you don't really want to um, to have in your model. So, for example, uh, in your uh, your input action, sorry, in your speak action, uh, you could have so you could have a class character in your model and the character could have a name and uh, okay let's just stay here and then um, and then that they could be um, male or female so Okay, so we could change our, so where we have a voice here, we could have a reference to, let's call this, uh, yes, character, I think character is a reserved word. Let's call this um, bot. So it can have a reference to a bot called the bot that actually speaks speaks this uh, this out, and maybe they can say, "Well, hi, my name is so and so," and then and, and then uh, say what they they need to say. So here we need to have our um, bots here. Okay, and maybe bot is something that we don't want to show. On, on the diagram, right? We don't want to show all the information, all the elements in the diagram. That's absolutely fine. Let's generate our editor again. Let me close this bit. <coughs> so, run a new Eclipse instance. <coughs> okay, so what we want to do here now is, there's no way to create a bot in our diagram. That doesn't seem, mean that we cannot have it in our model. I'll just close this to create a bit more space and I'll just put these side by side. Yes, so here I can go to my model and I can create a bot here. It doesn't have a graphical syntax, but still I can instantiate it in my model and I can say that this bot is Bob and it's male. Now when I go to my action here. You can see a bot reference. I can select Bob. And that's, that's fine, right? Not all in the information in our model needs to live also on the diagram when we have a, when we have a diagrammatic uh, syntax. Any questions? You all need desperately coffee. I need desperately coffee. Okay, let's break for 10 minutes and we'll continue with more, more GMF. So, uh, it's in, in my slides, I said that icons are also very nice, uh, very useful in order to distinguish between uh, um, different concepts in our, in our uh, graphical syntax. So, if you look at our current graphical syntax, it's quite boring. So, everything is a rectangle, everything is a white rectangle with, uh, uh, with a kind of grace. Um, border. So let's customize our editor a little bit. Uh, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to replace this auto-generated icon with something more meaningful, uh, more representative of a speak action and I'm also going to change 
um, the, uh, maybe the color of these nodes so that decisions are kind of stand out. Okay, so changing the icon of a concept is quite straightforward. If you go to the, your generated code under the .edit plugin, you will find a folder called icons. And then if you follow it all the way down to object 16, here are some auto-generated icons that uh, uh, EMF has produced for us. So changing the, uh, changing the icon for, say, speak action, if, we, if I double-click speak action, you'll see this kind of generic icon here. It's just a matter of finding a new icon. I have downloaded one here and just putting it in this folder, overwriting the old icon. So now, again, I will need to close and, uh, and restart my Eclipse. But when this happens, you will see how the default icon has been replaced with this nice, uh, nice custom icon. And it will already kind of make it a small difference in, in our editor. So you can see we have this this nice icon uh, now, and it also appears in the in the palette, right? So you could use something like I don't know, font awesome, and have a consistent set of icons for the different concepts of your of your language. Okay, let's customize. Let's change the color of uh, of decision nodes as well. So of course, I don't remember all of these annotations. Uh, by heart, so we'd need to go to the GMF tutorial under the Epsilon website. And this has a small annotated meta model and that, that produces an, an editor. And then it also lists all the different annotations that Eugenia supports. So for example, well, we have this GMF diagram uh, annotation uh, which we use without any details, with a, without any values, but we could have a diagram.extension value in there with that changes the default diagram extension. Uh, we could have this one file property that um, uh, that asks that tells GMF to put the diagram and the file and the and the abstract uh, model into one file so that we don't have these two files, but everything lives under one file. Uh, we can ask it to generate an RCP, like a standalone application, as opposed to an Eclipse plugin, and so on and so forth. So for nodes, we can change the border color, we can change the border style, the width, and so on and so forth. What we are interested in changing is the actual uh, color. Um, okay, so I'm going to go and add to my decision class, I'm going to add an add GMF node annotation and say that the color we use American, yes, American spelling. So the color is uh, um, I will put an RGB value here. Okay, so if we generate our editor again, and run a new instance of Eclipse. This existing node has not been affected, but if we create a new decision node, it takes the color that we that we specified. Um, the generated editors that the uh, GMF produce also support kind of changing the appearance of individual elements. If we wanted to change the font size or the color of an individual element, uh, we can uh, we can do that. So here we can go and change the color and say, well, this one, this one's green, right? And this information only lives in the diagram. Okay, so this is icons for you. Uh, yes. Shapes. Yes, of course. Let's do shapes. So 
wedge is shape, 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 shape. Uh, I think it's called figure. I don't, yes. So a figure where, where you can have a rectangle, an ellipse, a rounded rectangle, or an SVG file. So you can have, you can draw your own shape using a, gra using a, a, a drawing tool. You can export the result as an SVG, as a scalable vector graphic, and you can use that uh, to represent the symbol on your editor. So for now, let, let's just change it to ellipse so that we don't have to create a new SVG. So if we wanted to create a diamond, for example, uh, SVG would be a good, uh, uh, a good approach. There's also this <coughs> polygon where we can specify a list of points and it can create any, any polygon uh, for us. Or uh, we could go to Java and we could implement a Java class that implements a, an interface that GMF provides, which is called figure. And then we can go crazy. We can use Java to draw any kind of shape we, uh, we want. So for now, I'll just change, say, uh, this one to be an ellipse. And regenerate our editor. Oh, also, the, the GMF code um, can be extended. You can actually go in and change the GMF code, and it uses the same mechanism, that generated not mechanism, to preserve changes. So here you see how our decision has changed into an ellipse now. Um, and if you're worried about like the position of the label, if we go to uh, There's a Eugenia article here that would tell you how to create a uh, like a middle layout so that you can the labels appear in the middle of shapes as opposed to the top left corner, uh, which is what what happens by by default. Okay, um, you can also have nodes with images defined at runtime. So uh, of course. Now things start getting a little bit more involved, but uh, you could have uh, uh, every time you change the property of an element, its image could change, right? For example, if you had a concept called traffic light and it was green, amber, or uh, uh, red, and you change that property, then the icon of the, of the traffic light could change on your, on your editor, right? And this article shows you how to, how to do that. Uh, what have we not talked about? Okay, we haven't talked about compartments. Compartments are also quite, quite useful. So compartments are used to visualize spatial containment in, um, in GMF. So let's say that, uh, let's go back to our meta model and say that in our input action, currently we have this string variable um, so this is what this particular action will ask for, from the user. Um, if we wanted to have, uh, uh, if we want to make this a little bit more elaborate, we could actually have a class variable, which would have a um, attr string name and an attribute string description, so that the the system could tell to to the user, well, give me your account number and you know, press star if you don't understand what account number is. And then uh, if the user pressed star, it would read out the description of account number. It'd say, well, it's the long number, the first side of your card that has 16 numbers, whatever. And we could have an input action that actually asks for more than one thing uh, in, in one go. So in this case, we'd no longer, having a single attribute uh, is no longer sufficient, we'll have a val, um, a containment reference to objects of type of type variable. And what we can do, yes? Why is it not arbitrary? Uh, because we want that input action to own all these variables. It's a design decision. 
right? And what we want to do, if we go back to our editor, is we want to extend uh, the, well, this, I mean, let's create an input action. We want to extend this box here with a compartment inside where we can put in variable objects, right? And then as long as the variables are contained within this box, they belong to this action. If we move them to another, uh, to another input action, they get moved to the other uh, input action object. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a compartment here. I'm going to say that this reference is visualized as a GMF compartment. And actually, if we look at the details of compartment, Uh, we can specify whether it's collapsible or not, whether we can show and hide these inner nodes or whether they are always visible. And uh, we can specify the layout of this compartment, whether we can move things around in the compartment or whether we actually get a fixed list. So we'll just go for a, uh, we'll just go for a, um, let's go with a free layout. That's, that's fine. Um, Actually, I'm going to add another property here and demonstrate two things in one go. So I'm going to go to variable and say that a variable also has a type, which could be integer or string, so that the system knows how they can validate the input that they get from the, from the user. And we won't do anything with, with this right now. Anyway, so we have our compartment. We can generate our code again. I need to go and close my editor here. It's generating. And I'll go and run my application yet again. <coughs> ah, OK. It's not going to work because I haven't really said here that a variable is a node, right? We need to specify that a variable vis is visualized as a node. I'm going to kill this before it breaks. I'm going to say here that, well, actually, this one is a node and it has a label which reflects its name, attribute. Fine. Eugenia, generate code. I mean, if you feel that this is, that this is kind of getting a little bit boring, we have to generate the code and we have to, to run the code. I mean, you, you wouldn't want to write that sort of code, right? That, so you just have to wait a little bit, and that, that code gets generated all for you. Um, also, the, the newer instances, so Eclipse, uh, the Eclipse people have done a lot of good work over the last year in terms of uh, um, starting up performance. So the latest versions of Eclipse will run in like a very, very few seconds. So you, get, you don't get to spend as much time looking at this, uh, at this plus screen. And also this is a I don't know, six, year old, here, six years old computer. OK, good. So I will create an input action. And you can see now how you can't see anything. We'll see. Right? So you can see how now we have this extra compartment here. where I can create uh, variable objects. OK, and this is this spatial containment relationship is translated into a containment relationship in my model. So if we look at the flowchart, So we have our input action, and it contains these two variables, right? Now, if I was to create another input action here, and to move one of these variables in here, save, you can see how it's actually moved in the abstract syntax tree as well. Right? So this spatial containment 
has semantics. It's not just placement of, uh, um, of elements on a graph. Uh, good. Now, one more thing, we can have more complex labels, right? Right now, our, all our labels just represent uh, the value of a single attribute, but we can have more complex uh, labels using patterns. So if I go back, I will just close this. If I go back to uh, the documentation, um, so in GMF node, right, we can have a label dot pattern and we can use this sort of, uh, of format so we could say we could go to our meta model and say that actually the label for a variable is not name it's name and type and then the pattern is this one so it's the name followed by a colon followed by uh, the type. So if we were to generate our editor again, and run again a new instance of Eclipse. So here we could say that, well, pin is a string. And you can see how, by doing that, the type property of our variable has also been, uh, been modified, and it's now a string. So we can have complex labels. We can. Uh, we don't have to just use a single attribute for the label of a, of a node. Okay, so that's that. Um, any other interesting annotations? Yeah, so we can have, uh, uh, so here I've demonstrated so far how we can have uh, e classes, how we can have classes that are uh, annotated as links, right? Um, but we can also have references which are annotated as links. So now I'm going to change my meta model and actually not use containment for variables. I'm going to change this to a ref as you suggested, right? So I'm changing this to a ref. This can no longer be a compartment because these are not owned, so I'll have to get rid of that. Um, and now variables need to be contained somewhere, right? Because they can no longer be contained under input action. So I need to go here and say, well, all my variables live here. And I'm starting to push GMF, and at some point it will start producing compilation errors here, and we'll have to delete the generated code and run, run, run it again. But let's, let's try once more. Ah, okay, yes, and I have forgotten. Um, so here, now what we want to do, because we cannot contain variables within input actions, we want to link to them. So then we can annotate this reference as GMF link. That will just create a, uh, a link. Um, and then we can get, we can say that the target decoration is is an arrow. Okay, so generate my editor again. <coughs> okay. 
see right now I'm starting to get compilation errors in my generated code because uh, GMF will never delete code, right? Um, it's very conservative. It will never delete code that it has generated. So when you start switching things around, uh, you may end up with obsolete code that just creates compilation errors. That's absolutely fine. This is all generated code, so we're, ha we're fine to just completely delete it and delete it from disk uh, as well. Because when you delete a project from Eclipse, it only removes it from the workspace, but the actual source files remain unless you tick this box that says, well, actually delete it from disk. Okay, fine. And then let's regenerate our fresh code. And errors might occur, you might get compilation errors everywhere here, right? Because EMF doesn't also delete code. Um, but the only real artifact we, are, we, we care about is this one. Is this 67 lines of emphatic code. Everything else is generated. So you can literally take that, put it in another folder, clear your workspace, create a new project, and you're, you're ready to go. Okay, so the GMF generator has run again. And now we, we don't have any more compilation errors here, which is nice. So I run a new Eclipse application. Hmm. Right, so this has messed up my diagram because well, there's no longer a compartment here, so the, the GMF editor complains gracefully. So I will get rid of, I will close this for now. Now, also what has happened is if I open my flowchart, Are the variables still here? Yes, they are here, but uh, uh, EMF is just ignoring them. Okay, again, the fact that we are using a text-based uh, notation to store our models is convenient. So I've just got rid of the, of the two actions. And I will actually delete my diagram, right? And I will use the auto-generated wizard that uh, GMF has produced that allows me to create a new diagram from a model. And it will produce some horrible layout, right? But that's fine. Well, not so horrible in this case. Right? That creates, um, <clears throat> that maps the elements in the model uh, into, into a diagram. So now, I can create my variables on the canvas. Say this is a pin of type string. And because I've said here that the input action has a link to variables, you can see that this translates to a connection here. I can click it and I say this input looks at this variable, this input also looks at this variable, and now that's fine because this is not a containment relationship, so we can have multiple input actions working with the same, uh, with the same variables. So this is a GMF link that applies to an E-class. This is a GMF link that applies to a reference, that visualizes a, a reference. Okay, any questions so far? Anything else you'd like to try? Yes. Generate what? But this is an instance. This is an yeah. instance of your editor, yeah. right? So these are diff two different meta levels. This, this, so this is your language. So this is your language, and this is a model that is an instance of that language, right? Okay, yeah. 
and you need the former before you create the, the latter. There's, yeah. It doesn't make sense. It's not like going back. It's not back and forth. It's up and down, yeah. right? Yeah. So there is no way uh, we can have a metamodel generated, uh, not from this kind of scenario where you have to have a metamodel in order to generate an instance, which is this, 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 this flowchart. Mm -hmm. Is there a way? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we could do exactly the same work using this tree editor, right? Mm -hmm. And we could add our annotations here, and we could add our everything here, right? Emphatic is just a convenience textual notation. I just find it easier to type in metamodels rather than to go right click, new child, attribute, go to the properties view, change the type, etc. And you could also generate an e -core diagram. Yeah. Right? And you could have all your classes here, and you could edit them in a visual way. Again, for meta modeling, I'm just finding it easier to to type things in. But yes, there are, there are options, and again, these are all benefits from the fact that all of these tools work on top of EMF. So this is not part. This editor is actually not part of EMF. It's part of another tool that just works on top of EMF. Any other questions? No? OK. Yes. Just to like, so if we do any changes in eCore or EMF, so we need to generate the EMF file again. Yes. Yes, and we can do this. So, so far I've been doing this from the EMF model. So I've been right-clicking in Eugenia Generate GMF Editor. If you decide to work with your eCore file directly, you get the same option here, right? So you could, if you, if you just don't like text-based syntaxes, you can just work with a tree editor or with a diagram editor, and you can run Eugenia from your eCore file. You get all the options uh, again here. Any other questions? No? OK, so I think I'll change chargers because this is about to die. Okay, right, so um, so you will find instructions, you will find screenshots uh, for doing all of that uh, in, the, in the slides. So that you don't have to remember these menus uh, of heart. So you can see how we can right click an emphatic file and generate a GMF editor. And uh, we can run a new application. We can create a new diagram. And then we can start putting things on the diagram. So I put these screenshots in the slides for the practical in the, uh, in the afternoon. OK, so I've been very careful in this, uh, in this demo to kind of show you the things that Eugenia supports. There are many things that Eugenia doesn't support. GMF is very, very complex, right? Um, and Eugenia doesn't mirror its complexity. Uh, because if it did, then we would end up with quite a, with a, an equally complex uh, set of annotations and details, etc. And that's not the point of Eugenia. It's to simplify 
like to get you up to the 80% of, of your editor and then you can you can tweak these models and you can fine tune the appearance of the generated editor uh, using GMF mechanisms. So, let's try to do something that Eugenia doesn't support. For example, we might want to change um, the, uh, the, the font style of decisions and make that a, a bold label, right? Eugenia doesn't support that. So what would you do in this case? You would need to go back to your graph file, right, where, you def where we define all the shapes. These shapes have been generated by Eugenia. And we need to go to the decision figure. We need to go to this label here. And go right click, new child, basic font. And then go to the style and turn that to bold. So now if we rerun Eugenia, that change will be lost. Right? Because Eugenia will just regenerate all the models on top of it. It will lose this change. We don't want that. So for now, we'll just follow the, the GMF workflow uh, it, itself. And so we won't invoke Eugenia. We will go to the GMF map model and say, create that generator model, that GMF gen, that, um, that GMF expects. And then from our GMF gen model, we will just run the diagram generation code, right? So we're leaving Eugenia out, and now we've started modifying the generated models, so we're back to the GMF workflow. We, we've, we've lost that part. It, it means that we don't come back anymore? We will come back, <laughs> yes. There's a twist. Um, okay, so let's run our Eclipse application. Because we have to stop the previous one before we do that. <coughs> okay, so now you can see how these uh, these labels have a bold font. Right? Which is nice, it's what we wanted to do. And there's a lot more customization we could, we could do. You know, if you see, we could change the foreground color of just the label. And again, Eugenia doesn't provide an annotation uh, for that. We could change uh, the margin of the label or, you know, whatever. And Eugenia doesn't, doesn't know about any of these. Now, the problem is that, as Jean Marie pointed out, now, we are on our own, right? We have changed the generated models. Um, if there's no way to go back to Eugenia, it means that if we now make a change to our meta model, we'll have to change all these um, GMF models manually, and we have to go and create new figures and new labels and all horrible stuff that we, we wouldn't want to do. So what Eugenia supports uh, in order to handle such cases is the concept of a polishing transformation. So. Eugenia is essentially a big model-to-model -model transformation, and we will talk about the model-to-model -model transformations tomorrow. So it's a transformation that uh, takes a meta model, an annotated meta model as input, and produces these three models as output. So it also supports this concept of policing transformations, which is uh, which are scripts essentially that run after the execution of the built-in model-to-model -model transformation to customize these generated models in a programmatic way. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new file called ecore to gmf.eol. EOL is the core language of Epsilon. It's a, uh, it's a small programming language for interacting with, uh, with models. 
Eugenia recognizes it actually looks, when it's executed, it looks for a file called ecore to gmf.eol, which sits next to the meta model on which we invoke it. And if it finds it, it will run it after its built-in transformation. So what we want to do here is we want to programmatically change this model to add this new font, right? In order to do that, we need to first of all get hold of this label, of this label object. I will open this model using another, um, another editor. Uh, I'm going to actually open it using Exceed. The, that's the reflective editor we were using yesterday. Um, so here I have my decision figure and here I have my label. So in Exceed, we can turn on this structural info flag and then that will tell us for every model element what type it is and where it is contained. So it will extend the label and it will provide more information. So here we are looking for a label uh, called decision label figure. So I'll go to my UL file and I say that the label of interest is from the GMF graph model, it's, it's a label that has the name decision label figure. Decision label figure. Fine. And what I want to do is I want to I want to create a new basic font. If I look here, what I created here is a basic font, right? And then I want to send the, the, the style of this font to bold. Now, how do I know all of that stuff? If I look at the, at the properties view, what I've changed here is a property called style. This is an enumeration. Um, how do I know what are the literals of this enumeration? Well, if you click here, it's bold, italic, and, and normal. Okay. So what Eugenia will do is the next time I run it, it will just generate its default models, and then it will run this small script on top of them, which means that it will add this font, and it will change its style every time. So what I did here manually by pointing and clicking, I've just automated here using a small script that will be applied every time the transformation runs. So now I'm fine to rerun Eugenia. <coughs> Whatever, no. I don't want this diagram. So I'll just rerun Eugenia. <coughs> I'll close this. Run it again. If I create a decision, again, it gets a bold, it gets a bold font, right? 
and this is because of the change that was applied to my GMF graph model um, uh, through this uh, policing transformation. And we call it the policing transformation because the built-in Eugenia transformation produces um, like a rough, uh, a rough editor uh, where we cannot customize lots of aspects and then with these uh, policing transformations we kind of fine-tune the details and we get the editor to the exact state that we, that we wanted to. And this is quite nice because in these transformations we have full access to all the GMF meta models, the GMF graph meta model, the GMF gen meta model, the GMF tool meta model. So anything we can do manually, any editor we can create manually using GMF, we can also create using Eugenia. But instead of, um, instead of making changes to these models manually, we do this, uh, we do this programmatically. Yeah, go ahead. So if you delete, for example, the decision, if you rename the decision to choice, whatever, then you would need to go and change this code as well. Um, but uh, you will be forced to, because if you actually do that when, you, when Eugenia runs, it will, uh, it will produce a runtime error here, because that will be null. So you will know that something's not right. In many cases, in some cases, it may just silently not do what you, uh, what you want it to, to, to do. This means that you can also create your, so because these transformations also have access to the meta model, you could also introduce your own Eugenia annotations. And you could consume these annotations in here to do things in a batch mode. So you could introduce your own annotations and say that uh, um, you know right this has no semantics for Eugenia, but then here you could say for every class. What did I say? Big margin. Then do something, right? Change the, the, the respective shapes and so on and so forth. And this is how we have grown Eugenia over the years organically. So annotations that we tend to repeat a lot in, uh, in policing transformations, they just make their way into the core of, of Eugenia. Yes. It is, yes. Eugenia will just look for a file with that specific name for its policing transformation. And then there's a second policing transformation because you may want to modify this GMF gen model, which is really horrible. So this holds all the information the GMF generator needs. Some, it has properties there which hold Java code. Uh, so let's go to the properties. You can change a lot of aspects of, of the code generation uh, from, from here, you know, whether the editor supports live validation and so on and so forth. This information only lives in the, um, in the GMF uh, gen model. So there we could have another transformation called fix gmfgen.eol and Eugenia will pick this up after it has after GMF has generated the default GMF gen model and it can apply changes to that as well. It's these two policing transformations that you can have in a Eugenia project. This is for example how the transformation we would use if we wanted our diagram project to refer to another to another project that for example holds custom Java figures. For, for our graphical syntax, we would need to add that other project to the dependencies of this project, and this is controlled by the GMF gen model.
<coughs> Anything else? Any, any other questions? No? OK. Uh, we do have a little bit of time. So I think I'll just give you a quick demo of another way to create instances of your models that doesn't have to do with GMF. Um, and uh, to do that. Right, so we have here a model which contains steps, uh, which contains, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to step and uh, I'm going to have an attribute ID and I'm going to create my meta model. Right, so so far we've seen three ways to create instances of your meta models the reflective tree editor, the generated tree editor, and the generated GMF editor. What I'm going to show you now is a reflective textual syntax, XML based textual syntax. So I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to give it a flexmi suffix. So I'll call this evilbank.flexmi. Okay. Um, so this is a reflective syntax, which means that I need to register my meta model in this workspace. Okay, so this is actually getting now parsed into an instance of my, of my meta model. So I could have a, uh, right, you can see how this is turned into a speak action. This is turned into a decision. I could also give them IDs. And then I could create a transition from welcome to Okay, you can see that this is, becomes a transition between this decision and this big action. Um, this is a flexible syntax, which means that uh, the parser will do its best to instantiate elements of the meta model it's been pointed at. So um, the full name of this is, is speak action. Even if we type speak, it will figure out that because in the context of models, of a model, what are my options? It's either a speak action, a transition, you know, have only have four or five options. What does it? What is it? Does it match uh, against? And this is a normal EMF model. So you could right-click, generate XMI. So this is another way to create your models if you prefer typing rather than uh, than pointing and uh, and clicking. Okay, good. Any questions? This is actually work in progress. Um, this is something I'm very interested in and I'm currently working on. And there's, there's a, lot, a lot more to that because in this way we can define like functions in models so we can define complex element templates that can be instantiated many times uh, in a configurable way. Uh, the latest version also supports visualization. We get this. Um, so here we have a. What is that? Oh, 
Leximide. Combs, yeah, this one. So here we have a small language. Just close everything else. So here we have a small component connector language where we have components that have ports and then we have uh, uh, connectors that connect ports together. It's very sim similar to what you would find in a, uh, for example, in a Simulink. Um, th that's a very similar to kind of a Simulink type of, of model. And here we have a, a model that conforms to this meta model in, in FlexMI where we have a component with two input ports and one output port and the number of, uh, of connections. And we can use model to text transformation to actually generate, automatically generate visualizations of this model. So this is our speed monitor. It has a speed limit calculator component inside and we can move between representations. Um, which are automatically generated, so we don't have to do any, any dragging and dropping. All the information lives in the model, and then uh, using model to text transformation, we can produce these views dynamically. That's just a kind of quick insight into things that, that we are working on uh, at the moment in, in York in terms of textual and, and graphical editing. Okay, any final questions? No? Okay, so that's it for today, uh, well, at least for this morning, and uh, see you all after lunch for our practical. Thank you. Thank you.